it's going to continue to run with the masks on and have that same problem? Yeah. Oh God! <laughs> Eight miles with a mask on. Yeah. Oh my God! Yeah. Oh, I see. That sounds like torture. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. That's right. That's a good attitude. Uh, the local time is nine forty-nine, and we already have a room full of students. Wonderful to see them on this Monday morning. It's wonderful to see you on this Monday morning. And we will begin our program on the Columbia River Basalts, part one, at the top of the hour at 10 o'clock. So that's about 10 minutes from now. We are live right now, and so I'd be happy to uh, visit, say hi to people, make sure that we're doing okay with the audio and the visual. And it uh, feels like I've forgotten something already this morning, but I'm sure it'll come to me. I don't think of it now, but I was busy visiting with bunch of our folks. Bryce the interloper arrived at uh, 25 after the hour, man. So we've been at it for, feels like hours. Just kidding. Wow. Just, just kidding. All right. Uh, oh, I already missed a bunch of stuff. Uh, Brussels, Belgium. Good morning. Uh, Berlin, Germany. Cretaceous, Texas. Kenosha, Wisconsin. Marysville. Good morning, Mason. Uh, San Jose, California, Vernon, B.C., Nottingham, uh, Eugene, Oregon, Mendocino, Sonora, Arkansas, Billings, Montana, Knoxville, Tennessee, Las Vegas, Brisbane, Australia, Finland, Indianapolis, Indiana. You guys can keep talking, by the way. I always feel like things shut down as soon as I start talking to you guys. Please. Bryce, strike up, strike up the bed, would you? Come on, make, make I don't know what, like the weather. I don't, what, what are you, what are you talking about? I was like, we got both Emily's here. Let's make, let's make hay while the sun. We got Mason here for Christ's sake. Hello from Portugal and uh, West Virginia and Port Wing, Wisconsin. Yes, there's a Mason sighting. They're happy that you're here, Mason, and so am I. Madison, Wisconsin, Snohomish, Washington. Wolverhampton, England, Ben's in the Netherlands, Christchurch, New Zealand, great to see you back, Stockholm, Sweden, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Ipswich, UK, Scotland, Edinburgh, Scotland, yeah, Portugal, I, I see you, man, I see you, I can't pronounce your first name, but I can see you. Yahoo. Yahoo. Uh, Devon, UK, Foothills of California, Belgium, Armandale, Australia, Rancho Cucamonga, California. What's that show? Those three stoners on the roof? In Rancho Cucamonga, I'm pretty sure. This is like 10 years ago. It was a good show, too. I can't think of it right now. Ah, Monita, Virginia, Kingston. Yeah, so I have no real announcements. I have no uh, thank yous. Uh, you know, that's that's great. You know, it's, it's fine. It's fine. We, we Most of the cards were delivered. I'm still going to deliver a few of those cards to, uh, as I mentioned, uh, some of the grad students uh, and, um, and, uh, the custodians and a few others that are working hard. Workaholics, that's it. Thank you, Ashley. One of the three workaholics is from Madison, Wisconsin. Anders, I believe. Okay. Well, um, we had energy, and then I started with you, and then the room kind of fell silent. So I'm going to go and visit with everybody, okay? So it uh, looks like we're doing okay. Uh, I can unblock your outline. It's not much of an outline anyway today, but you'll see what the plan is momentarily. Thank you for joining us. We'll start in about, I don't know, five minutes or a little bit more than that even. But I, I want to go visit in the room here. Thank you.
What are we drinking this morning, Mason? Black tea. Black tea this morning. I prefer tea over coffee, but I drink coffee for caffeine. Mm -hmm. How was your weekend, Nick? It was really nice. I was out of town for a while, and that was just nice to have a change of scenery. And the pass is closed, but you're here, so that means you stayed over here. Unfortunately, Unfortunately you stayed here. And Emily, the uh, the drive today. It just... was clear because everyone's stuck on the other side of the pass. Right. <laughs> but you could get on the freeway at, uh, yeah. where do you get on? Do you get in at like Bullfrog Road or? Uh, or... Exit 78. 78. Golf course, road. Golf course yeah. So are you, do you, do you live on the south or north of the freeway up in that area? <laughs> I, I don't know directions. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> uh, let me, uh, the, uh, do you live on the golf course side of uh, the freeway? Yeah. Okay. So I think that's the south or maybe the southwest side. Okay. Um, all right. There goes Mason asking personal questions. Very good. Okay. Pedro, what's going on today? Okay. Lab final. Lab final. Thanks for the doing, reminder. Doing another, uh, Mason is overlording you with yeah. lab final preparation as well. Interesting. Do you feel obligated to be part of the Mason experience, or does no, it is it helpful? It's helpful. Okay, go. that's good. Yeah. You guys are meeting in person in the lab room at some time, or uh, is it some Discord bullshit? No, think, no we're doing it at once. You are at the lab, yeah. Okay. Nice. Okay. Well, you got to hand it to him, man. He's he's uh he's getting some out of, something out of being this kind of that that person. That's that's good. That's good. Oh God, here he comes. Here comes the old guy. He's gonna come talk to me. Are you in the Douglas Honors College? I didn't realize that. And how has that experience been thus far? Okay, well, we could have you know in person classes and stuff like that. Yeah, um, been a little slow. Oh, sure, I'm sure. Right, they like to keep in contact with people. They do, I get like five emails a day from them. Wow, it's crazy. Saying what, like, did you, did you read page 47? We some, some of it is. Oh, my god. Other stuff is like, here's the daily newsletter from this. And it's like, it can't be that much fun. Right, right, right. Okay, well, yeah, I'm all for burning calories, but, you know, sometimes it's like, hey, what are we doing here exactly? Yeah, hey, Tim. Um, all right. So you are registering soon. Have you given that any thought for spring quarter? Yeah, I've already registered. Oh, you did? Yeah, we have early registration. Oh, that's kind of what I thought. Yeah, the, the chosen people. All right. And uh, what have I asked you what you're thinking of going into? Uh, I am already a psychology major. Psychology. Yeah, because I am a junior. <laughs> okay, good. So you've started that program and you have an advisor in psych in addition to kind of your advisor in DHC? Yep. Okay, good. All right. Well, good. Well, any in-person stuff next quarter? I think I might have one class, but we'll see what the professor does. Yeah. 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 We can hope for fall, and then they'll say, "Oh, well, wait a minute, no fall, no, 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 no. You have to wait for winter." Then, oh, no, 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 no. Wait, wait. But before you know it, you'll be out of here, and we're still doing this ridiculous stuff. All right. Well, thanks for visiting. Hello, Jordan. I know that you didn't go home this weekend because the pass is closed, and here you are. See how clever I am that way? Are you on campus in one of the dorms, maybe? I'm in Student Village apartment. Student Village. What's that scene like up there? Is it pretty quiet, or are people partying, or what? What's the deal? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Calm. Some might say boring. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, well, I'm glad you're with us today. Hello, Michaela. Well, Jack, hey. how's GIS going? 
pretty good. I'm almost done. So. How are you? Yeah. Of the whole sequence or just? Yeah, I'm probably going to graduate next year pretty soon. Uh, yeah. Okay. So what will you be doing if you're done with the GIS? <laughs> no but you have to stick around to get a certain number of credits, maybe? Or? Yeah, I didn't pass a couple classes. So oh, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, I don't really have any plans after college right now. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. You like the GIS, though. You're hoping to use some of that, or am I putting words in your mouth now? Um, it's a long story. I kind of just got stuck doing it. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so it doesn't exactly turn you on, then, necessarily. I mean, I think it's cool. I just don't want to do it for a living. I yeah, guess. yeah. So, yeah. All right. Well, how about you stick around for another two years and uh, join us in geology? Maybe. <laughs> I won't try to sell you a Buick now, but uh, you're a good student. You keep at it now. No, because I still haven't decided if that's what I'm like permanently going to do. What's, what's your I don't know. <laughs> that's terrible, but I don't know. My OU convinced me. I think I'm switching to pre-law. Ooh. You're switch Mason. This is breaking news. You're switching to pre-law. Yeah, he offered me an internship at our law firm, and I was like, you know, I've always been interested in it since I was a kid, and I love medicine, but I can see myself practicing law more than. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a you know that's right right. Yeah. Yeah, that's part of the experience, though. You know, it's all, it's all in in the form of progress for sure. <laughs> there you go. No, you did. That's right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a, it's a thrill to see you here with energy and chit chatting with each other. And I will not comment that on a uh, so prolonged manner to to kill the whole vibe. But we do have some, even Cades here this morning. Good lord. Okay, so this is a it's spring is in the air. We are ready for action. This is the last third of the class, and this is the outline that we are going to look at today. This is a two part lecture. We're going to set up our discussion tomorrow by doing some work today. So there's a chance you might even pop your hand up and have an idea, and in a rare uh, move by me, I'll say, eh, we're not ready, we're not ready. So it's you'll see what I mean in just a second, but the first message is this is a two-day lecture, and, and we're getting started in just a second. I also have a quick announcement as I stall, as some of the late arrivals get this uh, outline written down before it goes away. Um, we do have final exams this week in laboratory. I think you know that. And, and you're like, well, wait a minute. Is this the end of the quarter? Of course it's not. We have three weeks to go. But hopefully it's been explained to you in lab that we've done all of our classroom stuff. And so we're evaluating you on all the classroom materials uh, this week in lab. Most of you tomorrow. Mason? Anyone who wants to show up will be there at 1 p.m. Mason is leading a review session for the lab final, 1 o'clock today in the lab room. Thank you for that, Mason, pre-law student. And the rest of us just know that that's what's happening. Now, are you totally done with the lab then after you take the lab final? Not quite. And you'll get an explanation uh, when you go to lab this week. But take the lab final seriously. It always kind of catches students by surprise, regardless of how much we say, hey, this is a serious deal. So I wrote that lab final long ago. I like it. It rewards the folks who really understand what's going on in lab, but please don't just waltz in there and expect to do well. It's a, it's a challenging lab final, and I hope that you're up to the task. So that's this week. Okay, I mentioned that here, not only to announce what's going on in lab, but also to say, it's a long list now of the things you've been cheated on, ripped off in the last um, year. But you're taking the lab, and yet we're not taking those field trips because we can't safely get people in vans and go out into the field. 
And one of the main lessons of our field trips that are required for this experience hammers this first point rather significantly. All of our field, we have four field trips that we normally do, and you'll be doing them virtually. But the idea is we have to make sure we understand this, and that's really the structure of this two-day lecture. Are you ready? In science, especially in geology when you're on a field trip, or in science, especially geology, when you write a scientific paper, you are always separating two different discussions. I'm slowing down now and saying this as clearly as I can, because it's what we're doing. Today, in this lecture, is nothing but data, is nothing but field observation. Let's go out and make a map. This thing is here. It's yay big, and it's yay wide, and it's this old, and it's all just numbers and dimensions and descriptions. And if I could be out in the field with you, which I would love to do, we would sit there on the banks of the Yakima River, and we would stand in silence, and we would just observe everything that we can see, and you would have some prompts on how to write down your observations of what you see on that little stretch of the Yakima River, or up on Menashtash Ridge, or out by Thorpe. And, and you're like, what are you doing? What? Why is this such a big deal? When you do field data collection, there is no story time. There is no what we call interpretation. And the interpretation for us is, here are some ideas of what happened here long ago to explain all of this data. And in case you can't see it, I'll say it bluntly right now. Today, we're talking about flood basalts, the Columbia River basalts, but we are going to be disciplined and today only talk about what we know, what the observations are about these flood basalts, but I'm setting you up. And tomorrow has the potential to be a magical experience. What? Tomorrow, we're going to share your ideas, your interpretations. So in other words, if this class is working properly, and I think it is for you guys, I really do, you have enough background to take the field data on your own, sleep on it tonight, and come in tomorrow and go, I think I know what happened. And I'm going to use some of the data we talked about on Monday to support my idea for the interpretations, in other words, what happened to explain these crazy basalts in eastern Washington. Is it clear? We're doing two separate things today and tomorrow, and it mimics what we always do when we read a scientific paper or have a geologic field trip anywhere in the world. Okay, it's going away. So the first thing I want to do is um, say the word basalt to you. I, there, I just did it. Mission accomplished. Basalt. Uh, whiteboard. Okay, audience participation time. Energy's good. Let's not lose it. I, ruse, I, I write down the word basalt. Both cameras can see this. Okay? You. When I say the word basalt, you think what? Let's make a whole list of things we've already talked about in this class. Can be a big or small idea. Places, silica contents, etc. Tim, 45% Silica. What else do we know about this? Pardon? Oceanic setting. We melt oceanic crust. More. Big and small places. Somebody else, Mason. Somebody. Go ahead. Shield volcano, Pedro. Yes. More. Thank you. Mafic magma, which indicates 45% silica. Wonderful. More. Diverge could be divergent. Like where's an example of a divergent plate boundary? Iceland, Mid-Atlantic Ridge, East Pacific Rise. Those are all divergent plate boundary situations, correct? What else you got? How about the viscosity, high or low? Low viscosity. Compared to the other magmas, right? Low silica means low viscosity. This is the rock bottom value. Remember, 45% is the lowest possible silica percentage. 
Anything else? Mason. Uh, gabbro is a, a rock that is similar in composition, but has a different texture, has big minerals compared to the basalt, which is small minerals. Are we out? Where can I go visit an erupting shield volcano, which is erupting basalt this morning? I can go to Hawaii. I can go to Hawaii. So we could put Iceland or Hawaii or the Galapagos. I mean, there's all these oceanic places, correct? That's the main message. Out of this whole list, Mason's is maybe the one we want to circle. Basalt is an oceanic story. We came up with a global pattern for these magmas, correct? And I'm reminding you that we know that basalt is an oceanic scene, that most of the time when you find a huge amount of basalt, it's in the oceans. Okay. So where are we going to the day? What? Stumbled over that. Where are we going today? We're going to Eastern Washington. We're going to a place that should not have basalt, but we have basalt. And we got more than just a little bit of basalt. But remember, I just want to look at the data. So that's what I'm going to do. We've got our map. Uh, you probably want to draw a map for yourself. Similar to this. Can you sketch this out kind of quickly? I'm going to do a bunch of stuff on this. So you maybe have, I don't know, a half sheet of paper with this map sketched out for yourself. For the home viewers, I have it all ready to go. And uh, we did this map once before, at least. Oh, we did it a bunch of times. Forget it. Okay. So. Um, let me draw a map for you of the Pacific Northwest on where we can map, where we can find these things called the Columbia River basalts. Okay? So this is Seattle, Washington, and Spokane, and uh, Boise, Idaho, Lewiston, Idaho, Missoula, Montana, Portland, Oregon. I don't know if you can even see those little gold stars or gold dots, but that's the story. And let me draw for you. Uh, pretty cartoonish. So I'm not going to fill it all in with chalk because I'm going to do some other things. So I'm going to put my hand right in the middle of it. So over the last 100 years, geologists have been visiting the field. And my hand is representing everything in this yellow circle that I just drew is dominated by the Columbia River basalt lavas. Basalt. There's lava flows that when they erupted were runny, had low silica, were exactly like what we see in Hawaii today. The whole thing that we saw in an oceanic setting. But obviously this is, must be a major story because we have the wrong kinds of lavas for this location. This isn't the ocean. Okay, well, this is the ocean over here. And I'm putting words in your mouth now, but maybe you go, oh, wait a minute. I'm a Geology 101 student, and I know that basalt is from the oceans. So maybe the source of the basalt lavas are out here in the ocean, because that's what I was taught. And maybe this is a story where the lavas are kind of flowing uh, on to North America or something like that. I don't think that would be a crazy thing to think if that's what you were thinking already. But that's not true because we know exactly where these lavas erupted. And you're like, oh, really? By the way, this whole week is Washington volcanoes. And Thursday and Friday of this week, we will be going to the Cascade volcanoes that everybody knows. You're like, what's that? Volcanoes in Washington? Yeah, Mount Rainier. Yeah, Mount Adams. Yeah, Mount Hood. I know the volcanoes in Washington. That's somebody talking in a coffee shop somewhere with a mask. But today and tomorrow are Washington volcanoes as well. But nobody, or it's only the geology fans that know about these volcanoes because there is no mountain. There is no mountain to point to and say, you see that over there? That thing erupted and made the Columbia River basalt lavas. There is no mountain to point to. Sounds like I'm about to launch into a story. I'm not. I'm trying to be disciplined too. 
All right. So these lavas have been mapped. You know what I want to do? I want to do one more thing before I go to the origin or the source of these lavas. Um, I don't think I'll belabor it, but we have enough people from the area that this might work. Um, Ellensburg is about right in here. So we're pretty close to the edge of these Columbia River basalts. Let me point out, especially if you know local geography, let me point out a couple places where you are right at the true edge. First one I'll give you is Table Mountain. Tim's nodding. He's actually, actually doing this. So local people know that if you leave Ellensburg and you drive up Reeser Creek Road, it's paved. And it keeps going paved when there's not a bunch of snow. And you can drive essentially up to Lion's Rock, almost to the end. It's paved almost the whole way. And it's called Table Mountain because it's freaking flat up there. It's a big table type, table flat mountain. It, the landscape is high. You're above 6,000 feet elevation, but the layers are nice and flat. And if you drive to Lion's Rock on the northern edge of Table Mountain, you're right at the end of the line. It is a major geologic boundary. And if you take one step to the north of Table Mountain, Lion's Rock, you're into much, much older rocks, which we'll be talking about in the last couple of weeks of class. So, Table Mountain. You want to go another direction? Let's be on I-90. I'm doing too much of this now, but we have Emily driving down from Easton every day. So, just above Cleelum, Washington, is a mountain called Lookout Mountain. Also, the perfect edge, in other words, if you get up on Lookout Mountain, just near Cleelum, you're at the very edge of these flood basalts. And again, if you go one step north, you're out of the lavas. Uh, I was going to give you a Mission Ridge is another one. It's a big ski place north on the way to Wenatchee. Okay, we're good. So we're close to the edge of this incredible province. But look, we've got these lavas going all the way down into Oregon, even down to the very tip of northern Nevada, over to Idaho. This is a regional story. And yes, even the northern half of the Oregon coast is made out of these same lava flows. So this is a big story. This is not a local story. This is a Pacific Northwest story. And it's difficult to go to one place and see it all. I've got some photos, of course, for you, some animation, some other things. But it's, it's actually frustrating to teach this topic, especially in the field, because you can't go to some Grand Canyon and see the whole thing. You can't see the depth. You can't see the width. You can't even see the volcano. So it's like this thing that only has power unless you take all these small snapshots of places, which we'll do visually in a second, and try to put them together. So it's a challenge to lay this out. Okay, now let's go on. Where did these lavas erupt from? We know there's no mountain, so where can we go? These Columbia River lavas, these Columbia River basalt lavas, erupted out of fissures. And fissures is just a word we have for deep crack. And so there's the source. These fissures, which have been found in southeastern Washington, northeastern Oregon, even down into southern, southeastern Oregon, we're going to talk a lot about those fissures, especially tomorrow. Like, why did they form? And what am I saying? Am I saying that a fissure is like a fault? All I've said so far is that a fissure is a crack. Well, here's our blocks talking about different kinds of faults. Normal fault, reverse fault. Remember this whole thing? These are not faults. These are not producing earthquakes when they were active. Instead, a fissure is a crack that opens up. It gets pry barred open. I would literally think of a crack forming in the crust and then some sort of forces. Uh, can I do it? I can't do it for everyone, but I'll just grab a couple. I'm putting in some white arrows. Every one of these fissures are tensional, meaning you're, we're literally pry barring the crust open 
and creating space. That's different than faults. That's different than earthquakes. We know a few of you drew it like this on midterm two, and I took some points off. These faults are not where the hanging wall and foot wall are just coming apart from each other like a Superman crack. That's not true. But in this case, that is true. And we know that these fissures were tensional or the extensional or from pulling the crust apart because guess what? You pull the crust open, you, in other words, form the fissure, and a bunch of Hawaiian-like lava comes up through the crack and floods the surface. So these are usually called flood basalts. So I might go back and forth between our a formal title of today, Columbia River Basalt Lavas, that's a little bit more wordy, or flood basalts, where we have such fluid, mafic magmas that if we can get these low silica magmas to the surface, they're not just going to get to the surface and sit there. Remember, that was like Yellowstone. We talked about those rhyolites were so stiff, and we get that stuff to the surface like toothpaste, and it just sits there, remember? I'm trying to remind you of volcanic styles. We seal all the gases, and we build this incredible super volcano. That's not now. This stuff is getting to the surface, and yes, some of these lavas come to the surface at these fissures, and they flow to the ocean. They don't flow from the ocean, they flow to the ocean. And a few of these flows made it all the way to the Pacific Ocean and got to points on the Oregon coast. It's like 300 miles. How are we doing so far? It's kind of a foundation building type of a day. Okay, I think we need to go to the yellow book and change things up a bit. And then I'm going to go to some visuals to change things up again. But the energy is outstanding. I'm having trouble finding my yellow book these. Oh, here it is. So let's go to 35, which is stratigraphy. That was on your outline. Page 35 is the stratigraphy of the Columbia River basalts. So I'll try this the best I can for both you and the home audience. This is page 35. Not a particularly sexy diagram, but it's the best way that I can show you the stratigraphy of this thing. Okay, great. So what we're looking at is essentially a German chocolate cake. That's the analogy I've used for a few years. So if we can picture a German chocolate cake, there's a bunch of layers. Each layer is brown colored. And each layer is a separate basalt eruption. You remember what basalt looks like. It's this dark brown lava rock, right, from the lab. Mason will show you at 1 o'clock today. All right. So we're just looking down on this German chocolate cake. There are 300 separate layers in the German chocolate cake. There are 300 separate eruptions that collectively are shown here. And you're like, I, I'm already lost. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, just play with me here. And you got to add a bunch of this stuff to page 35, or I guess separately as well. This is looking at dates of the eruptions and looking at this entire stack of the German chocolate cake. So let's get some real stuff here. This story starts 16.7 million years ago. That's the first layer, the bottom layer, of course, of the German chocolate cake. So the first of our fissures, for some reason, show up in this area 16.7 million years ago. We form the fissure, we've opened the fissure, and here comes our first lava flow. Now, before we get too carried away with this page, which is an important page, I'm only showing one, two, three, four, five layers, right? This is the bottom of the cake, this is the top of the cake. But I just said there are 300 layers in the cake. So what these are, are subdivisions. So just think of our whole German chocolate cake as one entity. The oldest layer in the German chocolate cake is 16.7 million years old. The age of the top layer in the German chocolate cake is 6 million years old. So this is a long time frame where we're building this German chocolate cake one layer at a time. But these five labels here are a group, a group of layers. 
So the first group of layers are the Steens lavas that erupted between 16.7 and 16.6 million years ago. The Amnahas, and then the Grand Ronde flows, and then the Wanapum flows, and then the Saddle Mountain flows. Let's keep going, then we'll open it up. Tim's got something you want. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah. Yes. Uh, let's come back to that. It, it, it's, the, it's the last eruption, but it's kind of misleading, so I'll show you what I mean in just a second. Okay, so 300 layers, but we're separating the German chocolate cake into five subdivisions. And I'll be using these terms quite often as referencing where we are in the cake. And this will be part of our discussion tomorrow as well. We'll be using these terms, so that's why it's such a big deal. Okay, um, what's this percentage business? Well, it's the percentage of the total cake. So this is not a steady building of a German chocolate cake. I'm going to give you some phrases that I will use tomorrow especially. Early phase, main phase, late phase. So in other words, this system, whatever system you're going to tell me about tomorrow, uh, between 16.7 and 16.5, is that's the early phase of this. It's just getting ramped up. And only 3, no, 20% of the cake is being erupted at that time. You following me? And it's not till the Grand Ronde time, between 16.5 and 16.1, that we have the system, whatever that system is, in main phase. It's working full throttle. It's pumping incredible amounts of mafic material. Almost three quarters of the cake is built during this time. And those are mainly the lava flows that are getting from the fissures all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And now we get to Tim's question, because you can see that hardly any of the stuff is coming out in quite a long span of time. So it's a real whimper to the end of this thing. So yes, the youngest flow is 6 million years old, Tim, but it's hardly any lava coming to the surface. And so it's almost like icing on the cake, I guess. Whatever our discussion of interpretations is tomorrow, and that's the fun part, of course, it needs to fit with our data that we are relying upon from field geologists over the last century and more. Mason? No, this is probably better to talk about tomorrow. Try it. I was just going to say, uh, if the Saddle Mountains isn't like the lava or the rather the magma drying up, because it is such a jump from 15.9 to 6.0, is there a chance that we're going down even more in the future, or it's gone? Uh, I, don't know, I don't know what to do with your question except to say that this is clearly a dead system. We haven't had any lavas in the last 6 million years. We have no uh, indications of any sort of heat source or anything. So this, this thing is dead. And it's essentially been dead since... Six, I keep looking at these dates because these are new dates. For most of my career, I've used some other dates. And we now have some more higher precision dates for these layers. And so I'm, I'm not relying on this sketch, which I've adjusted. So that's... That's my bad. But you can see that, you know, by six, by basically by 15.9 million years ago, the, the, the show's over, which we'll have to address tomorrow. More, do you have, a, these names, by the way, are places you might recognize. There's a place called the Grand Ron River Canyon. Uh, there's the Amnaha River Canyon. Wanapum is the name of the dam that's over by Vantage. We just have a tradition in geology to name layers in geology after places where they're best exposed. So we see a lot of the Grand Ronde lavas in the Grand Ronde River Canyon. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't put much more significance than that on it. I feel like we need something different right now. So let's go to some images. Uh, nope, nope, nope. I want to do this first. Okay, so we know what fissures are. Let me give you some nuts and bolts about the... I'll do it quickly on the board. Um, in places, kind of in the center of this Columbia River basalt field, uh, the German chocolate cake is three miles thick. That's data. Once upon a time, I know I wasn't going to tell stories today, but this is not an interpretation story, it's a story story. Once upon a time, 30 years ago, 
Oil people, natural gas people showed up. They started drilling. They thought maybe beneath the Columbia River basalts, there was a bunch of oil and natural gas. And they invested a lot of money to drill wells, exploratory wells, into this worthless basalt to get to the good stuff down below. They had indicators that there was some sandstones and other things that maybe had some anticlines that trapped a bunch of oil and natural gas. And they were shocked at how deep the cake was. I mean, they're at Tri-Cities, and they're at three, three miles depth, more than 15,000 feet. They're still in freaking basalt. They're like, what are we doing? This is too much effort to get. They finally got to the bottom of the cake. They finally got into some of the sedimentary layers that are clearly older. They found some indication of some natural gas, especially, but they said, we're leaving. It's just, it's just too much of an investment. It's just too hard technologically to get this stuff out of the ground. So this is not Texas or some other place that's famous for oil or natural gas, but it could be eventually if, if they come back again. But we have this inconvenient German chocolate cake sitting on top. Three miles thick in the center. I'll show you some maps. It's not three miles around the edges. And I'll show you evidence for that in just a bit. Um, I would pick one number. Yeah, let's do it. 100 feet per lava flow. So this varies wildly. Sorry, you don't even, can't even see this. This varies wildly, but let's just pick a number. Especially the Grand Ronde lavas, they're about 100 feet thick on average. That's a pretty thick lava flow compared to Hawaii. 100 feet. And it's flowing all the way across the state? How does that even, how's that even physically possible? Okay, so I do think the time is right to switch it up. Does anybody else want to say anything? Obviously, this is not one of those where I'm going back and forth a ton because I'm trying, you know, tomorrow I'm putting all my eggs in your basket. I'm hoping we can have a really scintillating uh, discussion tomorrow. And Bryce remembers that uh, from last time as well. Bryce. Oh, good old Bryce. Okay, give me a second because I'm going to be on this for a while. I'm going to um, spladam. Tighten up that shot for the home viewers. Get you guys set up. We have good energy here. I want to, I want to, okay, I always do that. Always do it. So I've given some programs to the public over the years on these flood basalts because it's a big story. And as I mentioned to you before, it's, um, it's tough, to, it's tough to get people to see it. It's so big, it's so deep, it's so wide, there's no certain volcano. And so it's a real challenge to kind of bring this home for folks. But this is my best attempt. So many of these are professional maps done by a local gal, Jennifer Hackett. And so it went back and forth, back and forth by email forever. So what's the orange? That's the German chocolate cake. I hope that you can see the details here on the map. This is a big area that's being uh, flooded with this very fluid lava. Yes, just like Hawaii. This is on a central field trip back when we used to take central students there over uh, winter break. And you get out there and it's super hot. And that's the same mafic magma we're talking about today. What are some differences? That's freaking Hawaii, man. That's not Eastern Washington. What's another difference? That lava flow is barely ankle high. It's not 100 feet thick. That lava flow is traveling maybe two or three miles from the vent, from the fissure, all the way to the ocean. Our lava flows, in many cases, are traveling 300 miles. Mason. Very good. Mason's noticing kind of the weird uh, gap uh, between, why isn't it just orange all the way through? And Mason's like, is that because of the topography? Yes. When are these eruptions happening? Give me some dates for when the main phase of the eruptions are happening between what and what? 16.5 and 16.1. Well, we can use the, the kind of 
pattern, the map pattern of these flood basalts to help us get a sense of where there were mountains back then. And that's for sure the story right here. Good job, Mason. In fact, we're getting to that right now. There was a rugged landscape in all of eastern Washington and eastern Oregon that got buried by these flood basalts. In other words, the German, the German chocolate cake is sitting on top of a very interesting set of mountains and valleys and rivers and all sorts of things. It's totally under, under, under lava now. It's like, it's like a ghost landscape, I guess. Let's get to that. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. I mean, come on, we know, don't we? We know what this looks like when it comes out of the ground. We've already studied mafic volcanism. But yeah, we're talking about this happening at John Stockton's house or some other place in eastern Washington or eastern Oregon. In other words, at the fissures, it looked like this, starting 16.7 million years ago. I'm reminding you of how fluid this stuff is. And today, we can only find it in an ocean setting. That's why it's such a crazy place. Now, there are a few other places in the world where we know this flood basalt stuff happened in a continental setting. We're not the only place we had it. But you need an unusual circumstance, and that's why we're spending two days on this. It's an unusual circumstance. And I don't know if it's interesting to you, but students that take Geology 101 all across North America are learning about the Columbia River basalt. So this is like our lavas that I was just pointing out north of town are, are in every Geology 101 class, essentially. Now this one, I hope I'm okay showing this one. I don't want to get blocked. Uh, I, I found this off of YouTube from a helicopter tour in Iceland. And... This is what we're sure it looked like at our fissures. So instead of the orange stuff just coming to the surface, look at what it's doing. It's fire fountaining. These are, this is spatter, volcanic spatter that's being sent up into the sky and then falling. This is not slow motion, by the way. This is real time. That's spatter falling out of fire fountaining. And before we quit by tomorrow, maybe even today, I'll show you that we have some, I'll show that again. That's, I'm going to get blocked. Let's get blocked for good, man. We have some of this spatter in eastern Washington next door to one of our vents. And so it's kind of fun to imagine driving to Pullman for a Cougar game. You're driving through some of this shit before you get to, sorry, Patrick, before we get to the game. This is us now. This is not some exotic place. This is, this is eastern Washington. My daddy's getting excited. Okay, so on the one sense, this just looks like a bunch of honey flowing over, and it kind of is. But if we're really close to one of those fissures, we won't, oh, look at that. Oh, it's hot? And then what happens? Oh, it cools off. Ah, oh. all right. Give me a break. Most of you have driven through the countryside of eastern Washington, know, going to an AAU game or a swim meet or a spelling bee. I don't know why. And some of you have even been in remote places. This is French, uh, this, sorry, this is Moses Cooley. There's two lava flows in this picture. Look at the scale. Two lava flows. You can see the difference, I think. I mean, it's like, you just get these moments, you're like, oh, damn. It's just a few, a few moments, you're just like, that's got to be incredible scale. And for most of us, we just drive around like brown cliffs. Okay, whatever. Doesn't everybody have brown cliffs? No. Doesn't everybody have a 100-foot thick basalt lava flow cliff? No, they don't. Anybody know where this is? Can you, can you picture it? Where? Yeah, we're at Vantage. We're looking north. This is Highway 26 heading uh, to the right, heading to Royal City. Heading to, again, heading to Pullman. That's why a lot of home viewers are watching. Well, I can't explain the international thing, but that's why a lot of people in the Northwest are watching because people have spent their whole lives in these places and then you show a picture like where they used to go on dates or they had a car accident. or They have all these personal memories of these places and then you're telling these really crazy stories and like, whoa, that's like right here. That's like an intersection with my life. This guy's talking about this 
this very famous geology, and, in, and these are places I know, say, say the viewers. This is up on Saddle Mountains, just south of where Tim correctly uh, located we were at Vantage, and this is looking into Kittitas County. This is our county. This is at Sentinel Gap, if you know it. How many people been here to see a concert? This is the Gorge Amphitheater. Who'd you see, Tim? Uh, Willie, Nelson. Willie Nelson. Who else? Mason, who'd you see? A Beatles cover band called Rain was performing. This is the Gorge Amphitheater. They get big acts, like, like as big as Rain, obviously. That's, that's, a, that's a huge act. We all know. I don't, sorry. Who, I know more. Are you willing to share? Who'd you see, Emily? Zach Brown, country. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Kate. Guns and Roses. Slash and Axel Rose right there across the river from our county, out in the middle of nowhere. I saw some interview from somebody. They said it was a big band. I can't remember who it was. They, had, you know, this is back 20 years ago, and they were just starting this thing. He's like, I think they're taking us out here to shoot us. Like, I don't even know why we're out here. <laughs> like, they couldn't understand. Like, we are huge. People in, around the world know us. Why are they taking us out to this godforsaken place? But that it's. The, the flood basalts are right there. Nobody's looking at them. Like the three geologists in the crowd are like staring at the cliffs. Everybody else is tending to other matters. Who else did you see, Tim? Oh, Steve, Miller Band. Steve Miller Band. All right. Okay. So home audience, this is a place within an hour's drive of Ellensburg. And these, these, uh, this, it's a very famous Dave Matthews every Labor Day weekend place here for multiple nights. Mason? All right. Thank you. One more band from somebody. Eve has one. Deaf Leopard. Eve, how old are you? You're 19 years old, and you went to a Deaf Leopard show. Now, that's some range there. I like that. All right. So here's a buddy of mine, Tom, who uh, flies an ultralight or a trike, and, uh, and just he's got many of these. T-Tabs, YouTube channel, if, you, if this looks fun to you. He's got tons of these. Um, I'm too big to get in with him, but he's got a back seat. So you could go next time he goes up. But he's just flying up the upper Grand Coulee. Remember the Ice Age floods country? That's the same basalt we're talking about, remember? The, the pre-cut and ready to be hauled off by the Ice Age floods? Here's one of your field trips that you are, have been cheated out of. Uh, I normally say, remember, we were all down there doing our work along the Yakima River, but these are the flood basalts that are up above our field site. Sorry about that. On, on behalf of the worldwide pandemic, I'd like to apologize. Wallula Gap. It's all coming back from a month ago, the Ice Age floods down by the Tri-Cities. Look at the walls of Wallula Gap. I can't emphasize enough how regional and how kind of like ignored this lava flow story is. But if you really zero in on it, it's amazing. Oregon coast, same lava flows. This is at Yaquina Head near Newport, Oregon. All right, we got it. We got it. So this is a place, my, one of my favorite parts of Washington. It's called the Grand Ronde River Canyon. So you've got the name Grand Ronde in the middle of page 35. If you're looking for a really cool little road trip, you go to the extreme southeastern corner of Washington. You're, it's not on the way to anywhere. But the road is wild, and it drops. Oh, shit, I thought I had another one ready. I don't. Sorry. I'll show you another photo in a second. It, it, it's a beautiful road. It works its way down to the Grand Ronde River. And there's a number of reasons to go down there, but one of them is just to see this incredible stack. It's one of the few places you can see more than 10 layers in one place. Again, most of the time you're walking around on top of the German chocolate cake or you see maybe two or three of the layers, not all 300. You never see all 300 in one place. Okay, well, this is a decent cartoon put together by Cynthia... Shaw Cooper or Cynthia Cooper Shaw, can't remember, from Tri-Cities. 
And we'll come back to this a number of times, but obviously the thing that catches your eye is the Columbia River basalts. And I basically want you to notice that the cake is three miles thick in the middle, but it thins to less than a half a mile on the margins, including us here in Ellensburg. It's, it's, it's tapering off to almost nothing. But what else do you notice? There's a lot to look at, by the way, but what else do you notice? You see these guys here? There's our fissures. And that's really going to be our central part of the discussion tomorrow. Why did those fissures form? Why did they form where they did? Why did they, why did they form, period? Why did there be mafic magma coming up? I thought it was continental crust we're talking about. It is. So where's this Hawaiian-like mafic magma coming from? Do I really want to come to you right now? Mason? So if the fissures were formed here, they're no longer active. Are they filled in with rock? And they're they are. Hopefully we'll get there before we quit. I only have five minutes left, but I think I might be able to get there for you. Yes, the fissures are filled with lava. Yeah, I'll show you what those look like in a second. Uh, oh God, each of these are really fun. So many of you that know the drive from Ellensburg to Spokane know it's a pretty flat drive. Even for a geology enthusiast, pretty boring-ass drive. It's pretty flat, not much to look at. But it's flat for a reason. Why is it so flat between Ellensburg and Spokane? T Tim? Really heavy rocks evolved, right? So yes. It's crunching everything down, I would rephrase. And I think it's what you're trying to say. It's, it's lava that buried a former world. So if we look, can you see, first of all, just on this map? This isn't a geology map, but you can see, can't you? This is Spokane. You can see the outline of the flood basalts. You can see the outline of the German chocolate cake. It's so freaking flat. But if you get out of the German chocolate cake, look at how wrinkly and rugged the landscape is. I think Tim was saying this, but I want to rephrase and say that this wrinkly, rugged landscape is here as well. It's just buried. This fluid honey just flowed over and just entombed that whole world. And, and so here's a map from all this drilling I was talking about. Can you read those numbers? Probably not. But it's this bullseye where it's three miles thick. The German chocolate cake is three miles thick in the middle of the bullseye. Two miles, one mile, half a mile. Okay, we got the idea. So if you get, oh, sir. So if you get to the edge of the cake, some of those mountains were not totally buried. Some of you might know Steptoe Butte. It's a landmark between Spokane and Pullman. Steptoe Butte. It's made out of Precambrian bedrock, quartzite. It's very, very old predates by hundreds of millions of years, this German chocolate cake thing. But think of how many other mountains like this used to be in eastern Washington that are now underneath the lava. What I thought you were going to say, Tim, is what we want probably right here. The weight of that, let me go back. The weight of this cake is so profound that it took Washington's former landscape and caused it to sink. If we have three miles of lava sitting on top of a landscape, the landscape is literally going to get depressed or subsided. Remember, like the ghost forest. So uh, I won't belabor this too much, but the elevation of the Tri-Cities is like, what, 500 feet above sea level? And yet there's three miles worth of lava underneath the Tri-Cities. That means that that former landscape that was above sea level before the eruptions is now 15,000 feet depressed. All right, I think I've hit it. So if you're at the edge of the German chocolate cake, you can get to these kinds of steptoe butte places where the, the flood basalts surround the mountain, but there wasn't enough lava at the edge of the cake to completely bury mountains like Steptoe Butte. It's kind of fun. It's getting a chance to see this landscape in a completely different way. I think, oh, yeah, how are your notes looking? This is Ashley in Seattle taking her notes uh, from a live stream earlier, and she has fun with colors, so good job by her. Here's Table Mountain that I mentioned just north of Ellensburg. 
German chocolate cake, yes. Just a huge boundary. And as soon as we get north of Table Mountain, north of Ellensburg, we are out to the basalts and into much older story. Okay, here we go. Setting you up for tomorrow in the last three minutes. Here's our first professional map of the fissures. The source of the lavas. And you'll see that some of those fissures are as far south as Nevada. And some of these fissures are as far north as Moses Lake. Here's a three-dimensional view of two of the fissures and again, the lava coming to the surface. And notice the fire fountaining or the curtain of stuff being thrown into the air at the surface. Skip it. Skip it. Skip it. Again, from Iceland, we know that we're at one of these surfaces of a fissure when we can see some of that spatter coming out. Again, this is a real-time helicopter trip over a basaltic mafic eruption in 2014 in Iceland. Pretty accurate to what we think we had here during all of these eruptions, not just Grand Ronde time, but as far back as Imnaha and Steens and as young as the Saddle Mountain flows. More Ashley stuff. I want to get... Oh, no. Okay. So, uh, I have one minute left, and here's your assignment. I'm depending on you tomorrow. If tomorrow's going to work, we're going to have about five different groups. Five different possible interpretations for why those fissures formed and why it was mafic magma that came out of them. So whether you want to talk with classmates in real time or online or whatever, or just do your own thinking, I guess you could look up some stuff online if you wanted to, but that would kind of defeat the purpose. We all have the data. We know the timing of this. We know when these eruptions happened. Basically, why is this happening at this time? What do we know about tectonics, plate tectonics of our neck of the woods at this time? What's going on tectonically to basically form those fissures? That will be the central part of our discussion. And if tomorrow works well, Christina will have one idea, and we'll listen to her idea, and we'll write out a couple of things. Ian will have something else. We'll go with him. Uh, Cade. Then Eve. Okay, so that's it's, it's happened before that way. And I'm going to try to encourage that kind of in-class discussion. And then I will be kind of, kind of shepherding our ideas back till one. We have ma one major idea before we quit. There's more photos and other things, but it's going to be mainly a chalkboard brainstorming thing. And I won't totally waste your time. And I won't totally keep it open-ended because we do have a good sense of what happened as opposed to 20 years ago where we really didn't have a good idea what was going on. Thank you for coming today. I appreciate your energy. The table has been set for you tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Be right with you. No. Um, table Mountain. Yep. Not old. Not as old. And. It'll be uh, until we get to the exotic terrain lectures that we'll understand why it's not pre-Cambrian that far north. Good, Mason. Thank you. It's like I promised it wasn't about what we're covering. Well, that's good. No, no, you were you were on task, man. Casey, doing well. Okay. Anybody got anything they want to talk about? Thanks for your energy today, Tim. Very helpful. So, um, are we supposed to think about uh, why the lava is mafic? Or are we supposed to think about why it came out of the ground or just everything? Pretty much everything. Okay. If you want to try to speculate why it was mafic coming out where it did, great. If you want to think about why the cracks, why the fissures formed, where they did, why they did, when they did, that's good. Um, 
Let's think of page 33, how 33 would help us here. Think of different kinds of volcanoes and why what we know so far about why different kinds of volcanoes form. And then this is this fissure thing, which is like, okay, well, what, what part of the discussion can I use? Yeah, sounds yeah, good. That kind of thing. Uh, good. So in, the, in my lab on Thursday, we're going to yeah. have the final test, right? Yes. Is that just on all the minerals or is there more things that are going to be on the test? That should have been explained to you last week, but it's, it's everything you've done from day one in lab all the way up through last week okay. and on the on the whiteboard in the lab room right now which is open you can kind of see my breakdown but it's it's more than just the rocks yeah it's okay. all it's all the map work all yeah right. hey um, this is jc jones's thank you the quiz credit, but not the lab and i wanted to give it to you so he didn't accidentally grab it out of your door. thank you very much hi jordan okay so our lab is tomorrow yeah our yeah test. And I've been studying for this test, and I haven't liked the way I was getting. So is there like something else I should do? What I do like for like the minerals and stuff mm -hmm. is I look up like the minerals, and I take notes while you were talking. Right. And look at the paper. Yeah. And describe each differently, and then look up images to like push it. But then when I get in there, sometimes I'm looking at the wrong image or like the sure. And so then it messes me up. Well, I, I'm. I love the energy you're putting into that. Let me steer you a little bit. There's going to be four rock samples on the lab final tomorrow. And those four rocks are part of the quiz we did last week. So I would just zero it down to the samples that you looked at last week. You've got that. Um, remember, if you go into my drawer, you'll find your corrected quiz that we did last week. And just have somebody, Zach was just there right now, just have somebody just work with you on those rock samples. I wouldn't go back to all the minerals and all that stuff. It's not going to be on there. Okay. It's just, just going to be four of those rocks from the yellow practice set. Okay, good, 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 good. Yep, you bet. All right, thanks for your... Mason. Final, are we going to be drawing out and mapping uh, the anaclines and synclines that we just covered last week? Probably. Okay, I just wanted to like double check. Okay, good. Have a great week. Um, see you tomorrow, Nick. Have a great week. Yeah, day. don't say have a good week. I'm going to see you tomorrow, I hope. Okay, thank you, Mason. You too. Okay, uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, I've got a few minutes if you want to ask a few questions. And why not? We'll just do some stuff now. I won't hold you off. I mean, with these guys, we'll hold off most of this interpretation stuff till tomorrow, but I'm guessing that you'll want to talk about that. We can. Why not? Uh, uppercase for the questions. Peter, so is it likely that we will never see what's under the flood basalts because the only barrier is money and financially not worth doing, not even just investigating core contents for exotic terrains? Um, thank you for the question, Peter. It all boils down to interesting academic questions versus expenses. And, you know, there's big National Science Foundation grants, but even those multi-million dollar grants don't have the budget to drill just for academic purposes. So quite often uh, there's mooching off of other work. In the case of the, the oil boys, you know, they're in their drill and they're trying to find their stuff. They keep most of their data to themselves, but some of it's private, some of it's public. And you grab the public stuff and you, you speculate. So the tenor of your question is what I think I understand is, yeah, we'll probably never know. <laughs> we'll probably never know the details of the exotic terrains and the other things that are below the flood basalts. That's just, that's just the fact of the matter. There's just too much basalt in the way. It's tantalizing, and it's fun to work with the data that we have. And there's, you know, there's always faith in technology. There'll be a new kind of sexy tool that will help us see things we couldn't see before. But it doesn't seem likely that we'll ever really know what's underneath there uh, to a satisfactory level. Thanks for the question. Let's do. A f I'll try to do a few more, just kind of in rapid pace here. The device nine, is there a correlation between location of the cracks and the old continental coast? Yes. So 
again, I'm going to spill the beans, assuming the students aren't going to see this before tomorrow. Why would they? There were 26 live stream sessions on exotic terrains before Christmas from my home. And we emphasized that there's a rather significant boundary There's a rather significant boundary right here between very old North American crust and everything west of this line called exotic terrains. And if that's a new concept to you, there's we'll, we'll do three sessions in here later on. But this, it's probably not a coincidence. I think that's a safe statement. It's probably not a coincidence that these fissures are in general agreement with that boundary between exotic terrains and the old North America. If someone tomorrow gets us in that direction, I will acknowledge them and then say, well, we can't say a whole lot more about it because we don't know about exotic terrains yet, but we will circle back later in the class. That's why this part of the class is very fun. If you have enough people who are engaged are socially connected, feel comfortable spreading their, sharing their ideas without being embarrassed, and we, do, we have that now, um, then we can just kind of have this working group and we'll continue to do that the rest of the quarter. And uh, we're there with this group, thankfully. Um, Dogni, do fissures ever run east and west? I'm sure they do in certain places, but not here. These are all remarkably parallel to each other with this flood basalt story. Uh, they're all oriented kind of northwest, southeast. Um, again, I want to start talking about exotic terrains, but I won't. But there's a whole set of, uh, there's other fissures on the map that are from different times that have a different orientation. Let's put it that way. Kent, could fissures have anything to do with East Pacific spreading ridge override by North American continent? That will be one of the ideas I'll be uh, fishing for tomorrow. Taking page 33 and remembering that the timing is about right with North America crossing the East Pacific rise and voila, we've got these weird basaltic lavas erupting shortly after that. Good job. Jack, the Idaho Trench runs parallel to the east of the fissures switch zone. I don't really know about the Idaho Trench you're speaking of, Jack. Is that like related to the Rocky Mountain Trench or something? Um, I'm sorry, I don't know what to do with that. David, who's the ranger at Dry Falls State Park. Good morning, David. Frozen ice to go with German chocolate cake at Dry Falls this week. Yes, uh, if you've been to Dry Falls State Park where David works, um, the cliffs are made out of the German chocolate cake and then Dry Falls is a place where the Missoula floods used to barrel over that cliff. George, much lower was the elevation of the crack 17 million years ago? Well, that's an interesting question. I should have brought in that, that cartoon by Cindy. Um, that's an interesting question, George. So let's go early in the sequence. Remember, there's 300 separate eruptions. So this is the land surface. I don't care what time it is. It's just early in the formation of the cake, okay? And then we crack the crust, and we send mafic magma up through this stuff. And then we have, let's say, 100-foot thick lava. And then that solidifies. And so this becomes the one of the layers of the German chocolate cake. And then this becomes filled with... Uh, chocolate cake batter as well. Okay, so we're done. Well, now we make another fissure. And I, you're onto something here, George, if you were visualizing this. So now we've got 
Uh, the, the, the next fissure, which is a little bit younger, we cracked the crust, but now the elevation of the ground is 100 feet higher than this. Um, so yes, we keep cracking, the, we keep building the cake, but we make a layer in the cake and that's done. And then we make a new crack, but the, the cake is taller. And we keep cracking, we keep cracking, and we, we keep making the cake as we go. So as the cracks get younger, the elevation of the top of the cake becomes higher and higher. Now there's a problem with that, as we'll see tomorrow. Not all of the cracks are forming in the same place. And there's an age progression to where you find the cracks. But the general concept is, is right on the mark. Good job. Uh, Judy, what forced the cracks that made the fissures? What forced the cracks? Yeah, well, um, we know the cracks were tensional. So we know there were tensional forces. And we, we simply know that because the cracks are filled with this liquid Hawaiian-like orange stuff. But I think you're asking, why is there tensional forces? And that gets to our discussion tomorrow. We need some sort of tectonic environment where the crust is being extended regionally. And we better come up with a good explanation for that. I guess I will hold you off a little bit on that. I'm coming down to live. I noticed these live streams, of course, are getting longer and longer as well. I, 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 gotta, I gotta get these under control. We'll just do a few more mainly because we have a part two coming tomorrow. Malcolm, is it determined if the flood basalts are deep or shallow mantle upwelling? Deep or shallow mantle? That's an interesting question. If you're, if you're a regular with us, you know that I, I fess up that I don't know much isotopic geochemistry just in general. I think it's safe to say everybody's talking about upper mantle here. I don't know if anybody's talking about deep levels in the mantle coming. Jordan, come on in. Uh, and I don't know what kind of isotopic signature you'd have for a deeper mantle versus an upper mantle source. But if you're hinting where I think you might be hinting, um, there is apparently a detailed geochem signature for a hotspot source, which is a deep mantle source. So I think I know where you're going with that, but generally I think the, the discussion involves upper mantle. That's an interesting approach to it. Hang on just a second. Jordan. Oh, I was in there talking to Shannon, and I didn't yeah. understand how I got a formula to pin on this, and it was because I forgot to staple in the other two Forgot pages. the pages. And so I was asking, I know you have a lot of- No, that's okay. Let me, let me look at that. I'll grade that and it can, uh, can you come back in 10 minutes? Yeah. I'm just about to wrap up with these guys. I'll just grade it quick, record your grade, and then I'll, where can I find you? Will you be in the lab room? Okay, sounds good. Great, you bet. A couple more questions and I gotta go uh, um, help a couple students. Urban, are the Russian fissures similar? We probably won't have time tomorrow. Well, we'll see what kind of per energy and performance we have from the group. Uh, but we probably won't have time. This is not the only flood basalt region. In fact, there are much larger flood basalt regions in the world. The Siberian traps are a, a famous example. And similar to what we were just talking about, there are fissures, which I don't know much about. There are thicknesses of flows. There's depression of the crust. The, the whole set of concepts here, but on a larger scale in Siberia, on a larger scale in India, and probably a few other flood basalt locations that I'm, I'm very unfamiliar with. Uh, but yeah, some of these basic concepts of fissure, tensional cracks, flood the surface, depress the crust, bury mountains, have some of the lavas flow hundreds of miles. That's all... Uh, we haven't cornered the market on that. John, are the fissures considered dormant or extinct? Uh, it has to be extinct uh, because there's just no 
indication of any heat source in the area today. Unless we're missing something major, I don't even remember what the official definition of dormant versus extinct is. I'm sure somebody has it here, but to me, it's not really even a discussion topic. But as you'll see, I, well, why not? As you see, I prefer the Yellowstone hotspot as being the main part of this story and the Yellowstone hotspots in Wyoming. And so I don't see how you can have more eruptions out of these fissures in this, on this map, in this area, if the heat source is a state and a half away. Uh, I don't know about Western South America. Daryl, is there an age progression in the fissures like West or, that's how we'll finish, Daryl. That's how we're gonna start tomorrow. So if you're looking for homework, <laughs> I did a flood basalts of the Pacific Northwest downtown lecture. You type in floods basalts of the Pacific Northwest, you'll find it. And that's a surprisingly popular lecture given the topic, but it seems to work for people. I'm sh pretty sure early on tomorrow, I'll say, before I turn to you, I got one more key piece of evidence, and that is that we now know that these fissures did not all form at the same time. That the earliest fissures formed down here, and the youngest fissures are up here. In other words, on page 30, whatever it was, Steen's fissures, Imnaha fissures, Grand Ronde fissures, Wanapum fissures, Saddle Mountain fissures. So if you want to start making flood basalts, and we do, the story needs to start down here and end up here. And of course, that will help or hurt some of the ideas that the students will come with. All right, a toast to you. Here's to your health. I don't know what the weather's like is where you are, but here it's a springtime feel out there. It's 45 degrees and the snow is melting and the icicles are gone. So I'm for that kind of a turn in the weather and a turn among many things in my mind and hopefully yours as well. Here's for brighter days ahead. Here's to the health of all your family and friends and all the important work that's being done on all fronts as we continue to deal with a global situation. Here, here. So in height. I got to go over to lab and work with Jordan and a few others. And I look forward to being with you tomorrow morning for part two of our Columbia River Basalt discussion. Thanks for tuning in. I love you and goodbye.